A NASA spacecraft has touched the sun. Here's what you need to know. For the first time ever, a spacecraft has touched the sun, with NASA announcing its Parker Solar Probe has flown through the sun's upper atmosphere. The milestone was reached on April 28th during the probe's eighth flyby of the sun, and CNN notes that it will ultimately make 21 close approaches over seven years. The sun has no solid crust, but the Alvin critical surface marks the boundary of its atmosphere, according to the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Outside it, solar wind particles travel faster than the magnetic waves that couple them to the sun's surface. Inside it, the opposite is true, and thus the particles are contained by the waves. The Parker probe flew in and out of this boundary several times over a few hours during April and collected data on the origin of zigzag-shaped structures in the solar wind. It found that these structures, called switchbacks, can be produced by convection cells at the sun's visible surface, which churn and create funnels of magnetic energy above the surface. When the probe set off in 2019, it had to contend with the fact that the Earth travels 67,000 miles per hour in a sideways motion relative to the sun to avoid being pulled into it, meaning any object traveling to the sun must cancel that motion. In order to do this, it was launched by the powerful Delta IV heavy rocket before performing seven Venus flybys over a seven-year period, relying on the planet's gravity to draw its orbit closer to the sun. Such a massive workload is ultimately aimed at solving mysteries like why the sun's corona, or outer atmosphere, is millions of degrees hotter than the sun's surface, or improving forecasts of space weather events, which can disrupt telecommunications and damage satellites around Earth, according to NASA. The sun's coronal mass ejections will increase significantly over the next four years as it ramps up into the next solar cycle maximum in 2025, according to scientists at the Space Weather Prediction Center who spoke to Space.com, and one type in particular could have knock-on consequences for our internet connectivity. Coronal mass ejections are billion-ton clouds of plasma gas with magnetic fields that are ejected by the sun towards the Earth, where they then create geomagnetic storms. However, as their frequency increases, larger CMEs can form when later CMEs catch up with those that have been ejected before them, and the two merge. One problem with this is that we can only learn a CME's magnetic field when it reaches the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Deep Space Climate Observatory so its likely effects are not clear until 20 to 30 minutes before it hits Earth, and at that point, in a worst-case scenario, a cannibal solar storm could push the world into an internet apocalypse by knocking out satellites or undersea cables, according to a new research paper from the University of California, Irvine. At the same time, oil and gas pipelines, networking cables, and power grids would also be vulnerable to being knocked out. Of course, a cannibal solar storm like this did hit Earth earlier this month, on November 3rd and 4th, without massive consequences, and summing up that positive outcome, one program coordinator at the Space Weather Prediction Center explained to Space.com, This kind of level of storming we've had hundreds of examples, so we have a good sense for what it will do to the grid. They're seeing it, they're feeling it, we're seeing some of those voltage irregularities, but at this level of storming, it's very manageable. That may not always be the case, however. According to Space.com, if the cannibal CME phenomenon happens with larger outbursts, the impacts can be more serious, and space weather events such as these should be seen as wake-up calls, according to Jeffrey Love, a geophysicist with the U.S. Geological Survey cited by The Independent. Of course, if the sun has maximum periods of activity, it also makes sense that it has minimum periods, too. And according to a study published in Astrophysical Journal Letters, one extreme example of this is that by 2050, the sun will actually experience a grand minimum, a period when it cools and dims more than usual. Sunspots will form less frequently, its magnetism will be reduced, and less of its ultraviolet radiation will make it to Earth. This phenomenon comes at irregular intervals and is believed to be triggered by random fluctuations in the sun's magnetic field. A dimmer sun will affect Earth by first thinning the stratospheric ozone layer, which will then impact wind and weather patterns. However, the cooling effect will not be enough to stop global warming. At this point, then, we are simply pretty much only capable of accepting the sun's activity as it is and working with it. Which is fine, as at the moment it seems we have much more interest in destroying ourselves than our sun has in destroying us. However, in the much, much longer term, we do have a different problem. In around a billion years, increases in the sun's energy output will ensure oxygen levels on Earth drop to levels that cannot sustain complex life, according to a study in Nature Geoscience. 
This is because the increasing concentration of helium in the sun's core leads to gravitational contraction, causing the sun's inner core to heat up, which in turn increases the rate of fusion, which in turn ultimately increases the sun's energy output by about 10% every billion years. At that point, astrophysicist Ethan Siegel suggests on the website Big Think, there is really only one solution, attaching a massive thruster to the South Pole to move Earth's orbit. Siegel calculates the Earth would need to move an additional 4.9% away from the Sun to maintain energy levels as they are now. Any thruster looking to generate that movement would require 500,000 times more energy than the total generated by humanity in history, continuously, for 2 billion years, and Siegel suggests this could come from a massive array of solar panels. Subsequently, the thruster itself would be built at the South Pole, where it would not interfere with Earth's existing direction of motion and could, over millions of years, propel the Earth to a greater and safer orbital distance from the Sun. The conversation explains that the mechanics of such a thruster could involve firing out a stream of charged particles that propel Earth forward, using similar physics to that used for launching a rocket into space, though it would require the energy equivalent of 300 billion billion launches. The new orbit would move us out of the path of some space objects and into the paths of others, according to Siegel, but we could achieve the goal of reducing the amount of sun's radiation hitting our planet, buying us billions of years before the sun ultimately runs out of fuel. Unfortunately, now we are only capable of affecting Earth's spatial positioning by accident, with a study earlier this year finding that recent human activity has shifted the Earth's axis and poles by about 4 meters since 1980, due to changes in how the Earth's mass is distributed around the planet caused by ice melting. If that effect, plus some warping of the Earth's crust also caused by ice melting is all the movement we can muster, then research from 2016 published in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics shows the planet is in for a somewhat rocky ride. After the sun's initial energy output rises, force oxygen levels to drop dramatically, and the oceans disappear in about a billion years, we all die. Then, within 5 billion years, the sun will grow into a red giant star 100 times its current size, according to a 2016 study published in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. At that point, the sun will swallow up and destroy its two closest planets, Mercury and Venus, and it'll destroy most of Earth, perhaps just leaving a rocky core intact. Beyond that point, in 7 billion years, the Sun will then experience intense loss of mass due to strong stellar winds that will see it evolve into a tiny white dwarf star, and somewhat tragically, if the Earth's rocky core survives, it may continue to orbit the white dwarf star like a sad old bald guy who's forgotten where he parked his car. So maybe for now, we should just focus on the cannibal coronal mass ejections and be grateful that they aren't something much worse. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.